Hi, Ariana Grande here. <laughs> and I wanted to say I love the Beatles 60 podcast because, you know, following the Beatles 60 podcast, each episode gives you a look into our worlds. <laughs> Groovers, listen. The interwebs are full of empty infotainment and the same old, same old about Beatles trivia. You deserve the real story. And what a trip. <laughs> Go deeper with the Beatles 60 podcast. The story from here just gets more amazing for you every day. Peace and love. I'm out. Ariana Grande. <laughs> How do you say it? I can't put a Ariana Grande. It sounds like I'm getting myself a cup of coffee or something. Ariana Grande. I'll take an Ariana. Can I get an Ariana Grande? No cream. Hold the sugar. <laughs> peace and love. Peace and love. This is Beatles 60. We ain't jumping around. I'm Larry. And we're marking the 60th anniversary of the release of the Beatles' first LP. Uh, we're going to dive into all the songs on the album. But first, you may be wondering uh, from the headline what it means to fail brilliantly. During this period, uh, they wanted their live and studio set of songs... Uh, to sound something like American pop R&B, uh, contemporary artists like Arthur Alexander, the Shirelles, the Coasters, et al. Uh, but they failed. They sort of created uh, their own genre, uh, pop and soulful, but powered by their long self-training uh, in rockabilly, country, and 50s rock. They would have loved to have uh, sounded black and American at the time, uh, but the music they created was something different, equally exciting. And this Liverpudlian beat music, essentially defined by them, would take them and others uh, to the top of the toppermost. Others would reach the top. The Beatles would go beyond the toppermost, of course, as we know. 60 years ago, they, they don't know. <laughs> 60 years later, we know. <laughs> Think of Jed Clampett out shooting at some food when up from the ground come a bubbling crude. Right, hillbilly Uncle Jed, he missed what he was aiming at, right? He was aiming at some food, probably a possum or something. <laughs> but fail, he missed. Oh, Uncle Jed. <laughs> but up from the ground, you know, he found enough oil under his land to make him a very rich man, him and his family. A uh, very, very rich man, and they moved to Beverly Hills <laughs> from Appalachia or wherever they're from. Uh, they So the Beatles didn't quite achieve their stylistic target, is what I'm saying. So it was their target. They were shooting at that. But their unique kind of adaptation of it was like hitting the jackpot. So who cares if they sound black American? Why should they? Although I love... The music they love. I love black American R&B from 19, early 1960s, of course. And most people in our group do, too. The, just as the Beatles did. But please please me, the album is soulful. It's as soulful as American R&B. Just as exciting. But it's not identical to the genre. That's the point. It just morphed into something new. It's, it's recognized as a kind of pop R&B, but... The only way to describe it is uh, Beatles pop R&B, if that makes any sense. Pop R&B as interpreted by the Beatles at the time. And with this somehow familiar yet entirely fresh sound, sounding both American and Liverpudlian, and transcending racial cultures and national cultures and crossing the big wide ocean... Uh, they're about to make history by going beyond the typical toppermost of the music industry, as I've already just mentioned, migrating in the news this year, 1963, from the music pages gradually to the front pages of uh, not even just the tabloids. Um, they become the story of 1963 in the UK. They don't know that yet. <laughs> in in uh, March, the the fourth week of March, 60 years ago, but that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. 
As you know, and we all know, and the whole world knows, the Beatles' favorite genres kept accreting, accumulating, and evolving over time. Uh, country when they were just young teens, and then rockabilly when they're in Hamburg and getting into rock R&B. Of course, there was the skiffle thing uh, that ties it together. Is Skiffle is like washboard jug music from America played really fast. Why is it that in Britain they they like they did they took jazz from America, but it had to be like hyped up jazz, like everything has to be fast, 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 and like you know, if you take like American Rock Island line, you know, it's like the Rock Island line is a mighty good road. It had some it had some like swing to it. The whole point is to work with the beat. But I have no idea why the skiffle version of that was so popular, because it has no sense of beat. It's just... I have no idea why British people thought that was cool. It took until the Beatles and the Stones and Dylan and, you know, eventually, you know, uh, Cream or whatever, to, to kind of... Uh, to chill, chill Britain out. <laughs> we were looking the other day at uh, Elvis Costello's dad doing, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. It's like all of the UK was like hyped up on speed, on prelis back back in the day. I don't know what it was, but like, man, it, it took, uh, I think it took Charlie Watts to kind of deliver finally, you know, you got to move. Boom, boom, you got to move. You know, had that been done by a skiffle band, it'd been, you got to move, 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 hey. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Why was that the national thing? But anyways, it fucking was. <laughs> there you go. I'm just bitching about my topic, which is the UK in 1963. I'm sorry, old British people. Sorry. I apologize. So the Beatles went through the, a bunch of these uh, genres, uh, country and skiffle, and then rockabilly and rock, rock R&B when they're in Hamburg doing, you know, not just Carl Perkins, uh, but uh, Little Richard and so on, and even played with Little Richard in Hamburg. And then they migrate to, it's kind of interesting because it doesn't, you know, they could have gone in the direction of Delta Blues or something, like other groups did, speaking of the Rolling Stones, you know, Delta Chicago Blues, slower and very, very uh, soulful. But yeah, you know, pop R&B, like the girl groups uh, in America at the time in the early 60s, um, that's pretty soulful stuff. And it's just, it's equally, you know, this call and response and it's with the rhythm off the beat and that's what matters. I can understand why the Beatles would have been attracted to these records. A lot of the Beatles' work was sifting through new 45s and albums, but mostly 45s, especially B-sides. That's part of what you get. You get not only their performances, you get their sense of what's good, their taste, their choices of songs to cover and so on. And the songs that they cover will influence them in the future very obviously, will show you sometimes really very direct, you know, then, of course, in the future, because we know the future after 1963, when everything flowers and, and this the year of Lady Chatterley's lover and the uh, Profumo scandal and uh, what else? The Beatles, of course. Uh, you know, Mary Quant and Vidal Sassoon and mini skirts and stuff. And suddenly, New Britain is like um, liberated from its stiff old past, its boring, stiff past. It becomes in full color green. We know that in the future, um, they're going to go from here. Then they're going to get into kind of Dylan-esque kind of music um, and then go through their psychedelic thing um, with their London friends dropping LSD and whatnot. <laughs> Man, you 
so this is like the pot music with Dylan and the LSD music. And then, you know, avant-garde with um, an album that's completely white and a label that's just an apple and a, and a music concrete on it. See you young, right? They went a long way and they kept evolving and changing and that's why they were super. Don't we all agree with that? Yes, come on, we all agree. In Liverpool and Hamburg, uh, they'd worn leather and covered all sorts of late 50s rock and rockabilly, mostly. But in 1962, they transitioned. This is what I'm getting at. We would see all through the 1960s and even uh, solo in the following decades that these guys like to try on different styles. Well... 60 years ago, from late 1962 until early 63, which is now 60 years ago, they had transitioned to matching European suits, Italian boots, combing their hair forward. And uh, most importantly, they were going all in for American pop R&B. They still had rock chops, though. They had rock roots and countercultural attitudes uh, but on the surface, they con they came across as unthreatening. Epstein didn't dictate these things. It was it was collaborative, you know. He he would suggest, and they would think about it and go, yeah, okay, yeah, let's do that. So they they decided to come across as unthreatening, more professional on stage, bowing to the audiences on nationwide touring shows uh, with other groups, uh, getting most of the screams and turning to a real youth favorite all over Britain. Uh, but in most of these songs, they're aiming at a black American pop sound. Uh, and we, we can prove it. There's no doubt about this. Okay. If you're, if you're feeling doubtful, like, Oh, really? I think it's British pop. You know, fuck you. Go listen to something else. <laughs> or if you're willing to have your viewpoint challenged, keep listening because it, it's going to be challenged. Their version of R&B, their version of a girl group call and response and all that is just as exciting and sort of transcends race. The Beatles are like rock and soul men singing their pop with boy man energy that matches girl group energy. That was at the time, you know, uh, coming out of New York and New Jersey. The Beatles weren't whitening the music like a bunch of Pat Boons, you know. It, it becomes a thing of its own, but it remains soulful, absolutely. Well, um, I saw her standing there. Let me, let me quote, uh, musicologist Dave Ribachevsky. In fact, I'm gonna quote Dave very often. Uh, so, uh, be prepared. So this is Dave. I don't know what his voice sounds like. I'll just, um, I'll just read it <laughs> and, and I'll say end quote when it's me again. All right. All right. John and I used to nick a lot, Paul explains, this word being a polite way of saying they stole ideas from other songs. If you really nick them, then it's a disaster, but, you know, the way we did it just gets you into the song, and in the end you, you never notice where it was nicked from. You put it all together and it, it makes some something original. Author Mark Lewison gives some Nick examples found in I Saw Her Standing There, one being the lyric, I saw her stand in on the corner from the coaster's hit Young Blood. The line, she's too cute to be a minute over 17 from Chuck Berry's A Little Queenie. Both songs being part of the Beatles set list at the time and 
Uh, the melody line of the Beatles lyric, How could I dance with another since I saw her standing there? Being nearly identical to I Want to Be in That Number When the Saints Go Marching In, a song that Paul learned on the trumpet back in 1955. Uh-huh. Another interesting nick was that the bass line that McCartney had written for the song was taken directly from the 1961 Chuck Berry classic, I'm Talking About You. Talking about you. If you listen to it, Paul says, I played exactly the same notes as he did and fitted our number perfectly. McCartney relates, even now when I tell people about it, I find few of them believe me, but therefore I maintain that a bass riff doesn't have to be original. That's his conclusion. A bass riff doesn't have to be original, says Paul McCartney. Well, back to Dave. I keep straying. I am sorry, dear listener. You don't know what the fuck's going on. I'm sorry. This is a... I did not take LSD, I promise you. I just have some a very strong uh, hay fever at the moment. And I'm on hay fever medication. Bear with me. The words of Dave again. This uh, was the first Beatles song released that features a falsetto. Ooh. This feature became a staple of their early catalog of hits as they closed their eyes shook their heads, and reached up for the falsetto notes during their performances, which created a frenzied reaction, especially from admiring teen girls who wet their seats. Such was the impact on U.S. audiences as they caught their first glimpse of the band on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964. End quotation. Well, I often worry for the Beatles uh, when they're doing like, ah... Uh, Ah, 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 and then they shake their heads, and I'm thinking, oh my God, their brains, are they okay? But it turned out all right. You know, they didn't get brain damage from doing that, so all good. It's all good. You know, on YouTube, we can only use music that we've uh, licensed or that we have permission to use, so uh, it's different on Mixcloud. If you go to Beatles 60 uh, website, beatles60.group, you can find our Mixcloud set, the link to it. Or search Beatles 60 Mix Cloud, I guess. <laughs> you can get the version of this show that has all the songs from the album. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to play music that we have licensed, which is some pretty cool stuff. It's from an agency that we license from. And uh, I like this track. So here's some <laughs> unrelated to the album, but here's a nice track for a little break. And I'll be back after this break. Suddenly... The world I used to know, I see it differently You woke me from a dream, now here's reality Baby, baby, you are really hurting me Cause every time you tell me I'm good and that I'm doing fine But nothing ever changes And now I see Breaking my 
I'd like once again to quote a Dave Rybachevsky's website uh, because he gets it right. And this is Dave speaking. For John Lennon, there would be no Beatles without R&B. In fact, there would have been no rock and roll at all. I'll, I'll never stop acknowledging it. Black music is my life, he told Jet Magazine in 1972. The Beatles and uh, Sergeant Pepper and all that jazz, it doesn't mean a thing. All I talk about is 1958, when I heard Little Richard's Long Tall Sally, and when I heard Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good, and when I heard Bo Diddley. That changed my life completely. At first, these influences played out through mimicry as Lennon took the mic for covers of classic songs from the Isley Brothers' Twist and Shout, the Marvelettes, Please Mr. Postman, Barrett Strong, Money, That's What I Want, and country soul pioneer Arthur Alexander, already mentioned, was the perfect bridge for John Lennon from country to soul. Uh, most of us have heard and loved his heartfelt soul songs, the Rolling Stones cover of You Better Move On, or the great Beatles cover of Soldier of Love. Uh, Harrison joined in, on their update of Smokey Robinson's You Really Got a Hold on Me, then fronted the band for Barry's Rule Over Beethoven. Uh, McCartney took a turn on Little Richard's Long Tall Sally. Amazing version of that, I should, I should add. I, I said, why can't I sing like that? I wanted to do it, so, you know, I tried to do it. Lennon admitted, I copied all those people and so did others until we developed our own style, a style of our own. Growing up in the British seafaring city of Liverpool shaped it all. It's something special. Uh, just to emphasize, all those Beatles uh, transitions over the length of the 1960s are fascinating. And this particular album would be in a, a phase where they have a solid grounding in rock already. As already, I've already mentioned, you have to assume they've already got their grounding in rock, rockabilly and country. But right now, in 1963, they're intoxicated with something new, which is this pop R&B, uh, mainstream soul kind of uh, thing. But... You know, um, they avoid the mainstream at the same time by doing B-sides all the time. As I've already mentioned, of course, this, this preceded their Dylan phase, their psychedelic phase, their avant-garde phase. Again, if the album doesn't sound exactly like R&B, uh, it's maybe because they weren't American or black. But these songs were meant to be soulful, absolutely. So... They will, they would, they told us themselves they were aiming to do that. They didn't really do it, managed to do it, but they created something new out of it. One of the Beatles' best tricks was to have on this or that track one guy on lead vocal and the other two on backup. As we know, it's really, I mean, famously, right? We see two of them on one mic and one of them on another mic doing the lead, right? And this call and response, like, come on, come on, come on, come on, right? This call and response goes back long before the Shirelles. I mean, it's not a feature of European music. This didn't come from, from Baroque music. <laughs> it came from Africa. Um, so it's before gospel, before work songs before Negro spirituals, all the way several hundred years back, according to Dr. Daniel E. Walker, uh, to a territory between the great rivers in West Africa. You know, call and response. Oh, 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 that kind of thing. The Beatles didn't go this deep into the source and the roots, of course. They didn't know that this was where it all came from. They just liked it. They just thought that's a cool, that's a cool sounding record. <laughs> That's all they knew, you know. And so for the Shirelles and the Cookies, you know, it was simply culturally embedded. They probably didn't know either, you know, but it was just in their, in, in their growing up black American. Um, what's true about the Beatles and the Shirelles and the Cookies is that a call and response style of group vocalizing working off the beat just happens to sound fucking great. It's pop that blows a hole in the radio 
right? Here again is from Dave's website, quoting now. The Beatles were very keen students of popular music. They spent much time foraging through NEM's record department run by Brian Epstein, as well as listening to radio programs and going to concerts uh, to find suitable music to perform in their stage act. They, in turn, became great fans of American music, and among their favorites were the sounds coming from Detroit, Michigan, which were being crafted by the newly formed label known as Motown. It had been called Tamla Records, and now it's called Motown. During their early performing days, they had chosen many Motown hits as well as other R&B classics uh, to cover. But the influence of that unique sound from Detroit permeated their songwriting as well. Key point, right? The influence of the sound from Detroit permeated their songwriting. One of Lennon's favorite artists was the Miracles, as they were known. Although this group, which featured the songwriting and singing of Smokey Robinson, were relatively new as of the spring of 1962, they only had two charted singles at the time, including the huge hit Shop Around. It was enough to influence Lennon to co-write Ask Me Why, the first of many songs to be credited with the Miracles influence. The songwriting takes us to approximately April 1962 with an original Lennon idea presented to McCartney. It was John's idea that we both sat down and wrote it together, just did a job on it, Paul stated in his book many years from now, continuing, it was mostly John's. <laughs> His reference to doing a job on it, as McCartney explained, most likely referred to its complicated structure. According to Mark Lewison's book, Tune In, it was one particular miracle song that was released in Britain at the time that inspired John to write Ask Me Why, this being What's So Good About Goodbye. Uh, the book states, With interesting melodic key shifts and a Latin lilt, Ask Me Why was written in the first person. The singer so loves a girl that he could cry with joy. The lyric is corny but tender and never cloying or syrupy, and John's literacy shows in the line, I can't conceive of any more misery. Not many songs used the word conceive. Several, however, had misery. Likely it was from All I've Known is Misery in What's So Good About Goodbye, which also happened to include the words, Tell Me Why. Lewison continues, Ask Me Why it had other echoes of Smokey Robinson's artistry. Both songs opened with similar guitar figures and had verses that ended in falsetto. But this wasn't plagiarism. Smokey was just the springboard to John's creativity. His song ended up different. So now, talking for myself, not quoting Dave, but I want to quote from Mark Lewison in his uh, Chronicle book when he's talking about early 1963. This is a really key idea that I want, you know, it should let it sink in. I want us all to sort of dwell on this for a moment. He says... Ironically, the Beatles, by early 1963, had for some time been attempting to gauge what the next pop music fad might be. Might it be Latin beat, calypso rock, or a resurgence of twist music? What they hadn't considered, of course, was that they themselves created the next and most resounding boom of all. That's pretty interesting, right? It wouldn't be calypso music, it wouldn't be twist music, it would be this Beatles R&B, this new genre, basically. But what were the genres that they distilled and amalgamated and turned into their own thing and performed in a fully exciting way, as we've been saying? Please Please Me, the album wasn't made in a style built from scratch, right? The Beatles distilled and amalgamated mostly American genres and turned them into their own sound. The Beatles would, in uh, later 1963 and into 1964 and 5, become almost a genre themselves, by 63, though they could have gone in the, as I mentioned before, in the Delta Chicago blues direction that was to become the rage in Britain soon, uh, they instead went the route of pop R&B. I know I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record, but, you know, I want to get this, I really want this to get this idea across because it's true. As we've been noting, the first album, of course, features covers by African-American artists, but even the Beatles' original songs at the time were meant to sound R&B. This is the point, right? They rewrote 
vaguely black pop their way, as poppy and catchy as they could, just as exciting and really fresh, especially on uh, UK media, it sounded like, whoa, what is this, you know? It's truly a new trend, a new boom, a new sound. By definition, of course, it would be labeled as music from Britain, the northwest of England, more precisely. And when they brought the music back to America, people always say, yeah, we just brought it back to you. And, you, you know, but I think, I think Americans did recognize that the music was very familiar to Americans. And I think that it's equally exotic and familiar for UK people, the American part of it was exotic, and the UK part of their music, the Mersey part of it was familiar, you know, because people have been watching Coronation Street or whatever. And when they finally get to America, of course, the British side of it is very exotic for Americans. But the American side to what they're doing um, was very familiar at the same time. So, uh, you know, we sort of, sort of speak the same language sometimes. Uh, their hair and their suits and boots would be their own thing. Um, their attitudes and humor were as scousy as their accents. Yet I think we've established that this first album was meant to be their own kind of, what am I going to say? R&B. Please Please Me, the song, their second single, was virtually a number one on the UK charts. Technically, technically number two. Too much trivia to go into. I don't give a fuck, really. You know, number one, number two, whatever. It was way, way up, all right? And people heard it. You know, why do we care about technicalities? The point is that this was already a big hit before the album was released 60 years ago this week. As Britain thawed out from its most horrible winter weather in living memory, this was the sound of the new Britain. Liverpudlian call and response to a steady beat. To young consumers of media at the time, it was just a fresh new sound that seemed to come out of nowhere. We know it came out of somewhere, but to, to most people there and then, it seemed to come out of nowhere, you see. All right, well, Dave Ribachevsky talking about um, the song Please Please Me and the call and response and all that. He's saying the same melodic phrase is repeated with different lyrics before a dramatic break occurs. Uh, introducing a new guitar riff, which segues into the anticipatory come on, come on, call and response section of the verse. The calls are sung solo by John, while the responses are harmonized by Paul and George. This climaxes into the title of the song near the end of the verse, which acts as the true hook line of the song. It is an amazing song. Then again, we hear the harmonica guitar riff to set the stage for the second verse. End quote. All right. This first album, released in the UK 60 years ago this week, uh, would be their only pre-fame LP. Think of that. They weren't famous yet. Just before. And it's like an oral snapshot of where their live set was at the moment. Could be the most purely beatled up pop R&B album that they would ever record. Actually, uh, they recorded it in February as fame seemed to be on the way. By the time Parlophone released it a month later, which is March, 60 years ago now, they were already becoming uh, established chart toppers, hit makers. Raphael Polcaro, writing in uh, rock and roll garage, or, or if you're British again, I'm sorry, I'm taking the piss out of British people in this episode. It's just, I'm just having some fun. Don't, don't hate me. All right. <laughs> I'm just a, a goofy yank. You can write me off, but in, if, if you're from London, it's the rock and roll garage. It's a rock and roll garage. Or if you're American, the rock and roll garage. Um, so here's Raphael's words. McCartney told Bass Player magazine back in 2005 that James Jameson, session bassist on most of uh, the Motown record hits of the 60s and 70s, was from who he picked up his style and transformed into something else in the songs. He was a major influence all around. He was certainly where I picked up a lot of my style. I simply loved all of his bass lines. I can't, I can't do Paul. I can't do a Paul of Bruce Nation. Back to Raphael's words. McCartney continued singing, uh, the Four Tops hit, 
I can't help myself, sugar pie, honey bunch. And he says, each one of them a gem in itself. I'd, I'd have to listen to my old tracks to point out the direct influences. Uh, I'm not a great retainer or analyst of what I do. Really, I, I just tried to take his ideas to my own place. Anyway, let's move on. Back to my favorite <laughs> source for this episode, Dave Rybachevsky. Here he is talking about Love Me Do, quoting him. Being that four years had passed since they originally composed Love Me Do, or started composing it, let's say, they decided to interject some of their more recent influences when they took it up again in 62, I think it was, right? They lowered the key to G major and slowed the tempo somewhat to give it a more bluesy feel. McCartney is quoted as saying that the song was their attempt to do the blues, although it cannot whiter, because it always does. <laughs> the blues sound of Arthur Alexander was incorporated in Love Me Too, as well as the harmonica of Bruce Chanel's recent hit, Hey Baby. Hey, hey, baby. The harmonica parts are almost identical. Uh, love, love me, hey, baby. <laughs> in 1963... Uh, John explained their revamping of Love Me Do to Melody Maker. Here's what John said. It was just after Hey Baby came out, and we were hoping to, to be the first uh, British group to use harmonica on record. All right, so that's Love Me Do. Now here's Dave Rybachevsky, uh talking about uh, P.S. I Love You. He says, as to the song's authorship, it's agreed by both John and Paul that it was mostly, if not completely, McCartney's song. Lennon is quoted as saying that he might have contributed something, but elaborates further in another interview by saying, I think we helped him a bit. He was trying to write a Soldier Boy like the Shirelles track. Soldier Boy was a hit in, in April of 62, 1962, a copy of this record uh, being recently sent by Brian Epstein to Hamburg uh, for the Beatles to consider performing, which they quickly incorporated into their stage act in Germany between April 11th and June 4th of 1962. Uh, the Beatles interpreted the lyrics to Soldier Boy as a love letter being read out loud, thereby being the main inspiration for mimicking in P.S. I Love You. So there you go. End quotation. Do you want to know a secret? Composed by John Lennon, sung by the Beatles on the LP Please Please Me by George. The R&B hit I Really Love You by the Stereos from 1961 strikes a similar rhythm and tempo and is cited by George as an influence on Do You Want to Know a Secret? Quote, Dave Rybachevsky. So there you go. Congratulations to all who were involved in the making of this first Beatles album, the surviving Beatles, of course. Thank you, guys. Sir Ringo, Sir Paul. Are any of the engineers still living? I don't know. Um, but uh, anyway, special thanks to Dave Rybachevsky. Thanks also to my co-host Andy, who's not here at the moment. Uh, he's taking some much-needed time away from blogging, podcasting, etc., for a while uh, you know sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do you know but I think he'll be back I think he'll be back he should be back I hope that everything's okay we'll see but he's been nowhere on the internet like not so much mm. anyhow we're missing him aren't we it's weird podcasting alone <laughs> be sure to Visit our website to find all our various YouTube segments, podcast episodes, Facebook group, and so on. It's Beatles 60, all one word, B-E-A-T-L-E-S-6-0, dot group. Beatles 60 dot group. 
check the internet. So bye for now and uh, thanks for listening. This was only part of a longer audio podcast. Uh, you can find one or two other parts of this episode uh, on our YouTube channel. We post audio to YouTube only in short segments to make them easy to share. If your purpose is to share short segments of our audio podcast, then the YouTube clips can be convenient. But our YouTube channel is just for segments. Uh, it's audio, so there's nothing to look at. We're not really interested in producing video content. So, for Beatles 60, to tell you the truth, the YouTube channel is really where the action isn't. If you want a continuous listening experience for yourself while washing up or while hiking or while commuting, similar to listening to audiobooks, then we recommend getting our full podcast episodes automatically sent to your phone or your tablet or your PC um, every month. Use a podcast app. It's easy to find us and subscribe. There's a link in the show notes, or you can always go to beetle60.group. You see, you navigate down to uh, one of the episode pictures on the front page, and then you tap that, and then there's a description of the episode, and then listen now, and then you tap that, and you can choose any uh, podcast app that works for you. Or you could listen right there if you want to. Hmm. This is Beatles 60. The interval between this podcast and our next podcast will, 60 years ago, have been the exact same interval. Get the idea? The Beatles will have experienced the exact same number of days, same season. All of you who have been following this real-time chronicle with us already get the pace. You already understand, right? Same speed. Technically, we'd call this a longitudinal phenomenological hey, hey. historiographic study. All right. eh? What's with all the academic jargon? Well, this is a serious series. The Earth turns at one speed and in one way, am I right? At least in lived experience, last I looked. Now remember, the future is unwritten. Ultimately, we're talking about human experience. We can't walk in the Beatles' boots if we're jumping around all different billions and billions of years. As nothing could make any sense. So come on. We got to repeat that slogan. This is a chronicle. 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 Beatles 60. We ain't jumping around.